How can product designers create beautiful objects within the constraints of manufacturing and efficiency? We're speaking with Theo Richardson of RBW. They're a design company that's tightly coupled to manufacturing. And John Hirschstick is the founder of Onshape and the head of the SaaS business at PTC. John, it's great to see you again. Tell us about Onshape, what you're doing, and, and also tell us about your background. Thanks, Michael. Great to be back. Um, Onshape is the world's first and only full SaaS, full software as a service platform for product design. And we combine CAD and data management and collaboration tools with all sorts of other tools for the product developers of the world. Basically, products, manufactured products today are built twice. They're built once in the computer to make sure they're right, and then they're built in the physical world. And we're kind of the Google Docs of CAD, if you will. And I've worked in the field of CAD and related software for product development for almost 40 years, my whole career. And uh, previously, I'd been a uh, founder and a longtime CEO at SolidWorks. And I was a founder and CEO at Onshape until we were acquired by PTC a year ago. And now I'm, uh, I'm the head of the software as a service SaaS business unit at PTC. Theo Richardson, it's great to see you today. Tell us about your work and tell us where you're focused right now. So at RBW, we believe there's a reason why people say brighten your day. That's because light has a profound influence in shaping the way we feel. And at RBW, we design, manufacture, sell, and distribute LED lighting products for primarily architects, interior designers, but also homeowners as well. And um, what we have been focusing on is uh, certainly for for the entirety of our business design, but also um, we see ourselves as designing the business and we are focused right now on Industry 4.0 and the integration of our core platforms, ERP, CAD, and the shop floor. Tell us about your business model. So our business model is a B2B driven primarily, and we sell decorative light fixtures to often um, technology workplaces, uh, hospitality environments, and uh, residential uh, interiors. We work through uh, a as sales rep network. We work through rbw.com uh, directly through our website, and we also sell through uh, online retailer ylighting.com. And I want to make everyone aware that uh, we are always looking for creative and talented team members to join us. Um, so if the ideas of Industry 4.0 design and manufacturing excite you, please visit rbw.com and our careers page. One of the things that I hope we discuss today is the mass customization approach that you've taken. Do you want to tell us about that quickly? Our customer is focused on creating a unique environment, and that might mean the perfect fixture that provides the right quality of light, but also something that matches their interior. So these are designers. They're incredibly focused on the visual aesthetic and, and the visual experience uh, that the environment creates. They might be working for a brand and the brand wants something very specific or particular. So we offer a high level of customization, um, specifically of finishes, but also product forms. And we are a small team, roughly about 50 people right now. We offer 77,000 catalog SKUs, and we see a future where we will be offering 7 million. Um, we do this on a 10-day production lead time. How do you do that? That's extraordinary. So we are working to integrate our ERP website, CAD platform, and shop floor so that the customer can figure order a product that is pings the engineering documentation. It hits the ERP platform, communicates to the shop floor, shop floor can then access engineering documentation, basically building bill of materials and instructions for assembly on the fly. And you're proudly made in the USA. Yes, we are building products out of Industry City, Brooklyn. We're in a 10,000 square foot space here. And, uh, this is the, the headquarters for our team. We have a showroom in Soho at 50 Green Street. John, let's talk about this tension that sometimes exists between design and manufacturing constraints. Can you summarize that issue for us and, and what tends to happen 
in reality, uh, down on the ground? From where I sit with the customers I see, you have a lot of tension between design and manufacturing because generally designers like to think of things that sometimes can't be made or can't be made practically. They can't be made at cost. They can't be made at volume. They can't be made with the reliability that's needed. Um, quality, you know, is a big issue. Consistency is sometimes an issue. You know, it can be made, but the units will come out varying too much. They're all good individually, but they're not the same. Um, so all kinds of problems come in. A lot of times design and manufacturing knowledge is too separated and the communication paths are, are too separated. So you, you get communication happening too poorly and too late. And then by the time you hit some collision, you have to compromise in some way that's you know, just not ideal for anyone. So that's kind of a quick high level view of the kinds of issues I see coming up over and over again as I deal with the product developers of the world. Theo, you must bump into this all the time, or at least see this, given the nature of your business, which brings design and manufacturing so close together. Yeah, I, I definitely second those thoughts about um, access um, collaboration. You know, one of the biggest costs, I think, for, for many companies is the idea of the time to market. So we think of often in terms, maybe in the past, of sequential phases. What if you could run those concurrently? What if you could have various teams that work at the same time on different parts of the problem, aware of each other's work? Um, so in terms of running a small team that's trying to tackle a big problem, a, a large scale of combinations and, and the challenges that that presents, we we think it's really important to be able to have visibility across our enterprise for different team members to see what each other are working on. Given the importance of that, Theo, how do you establish that kind of collaborative and strong communication environment? Yeah. So, John, you mentioned Google Docs. We've been on Google Docs pretty much since the inception of our business of and just about 12 years ago now. And um, this is the first time that we've seen a product that really is something similar to to that collaborative way of working. You know, I'm, I'm in the first paragraph, somebody else is in the third paragraph and real time live editing collaboratively. John, I see you're smiling. It must be great to hear a customer talking about your brainchild. Yeah, it is. It's very, very uh, rewarding to hear that, Michael. It's always very rewarding when I see people using our products in any way. I think all engineers and product developers get a special thrill out of people using their products, and especially if they use them and like them, and especially if they use them and like them for the reasons that we aspire our products to be liked. I like to think in some ways these digital collaboration tools bring us back to a world where maybe a company was around a table with a physical object in front of them. And, and that kind of collaboration is now possible, even if we're distributed in multiple locations with team members who just met the day before digitally and never even seen each other face to face, they can work that way. And that's, that's what I think about when I hear, um, hear Theo talking. Theo, but all of this does not change the need to be very clear about the constraints of manufacturing as you're trying to design the most beautiful product possible and balancing cost, time, materials, manufacturing capabilities. How do you manage these conflicting goals? Are, are, are they even conflicting goals? I think at times they are conflicting goals, but I, I think also of design as being the you know an elegant solution an elegant response to the constraints the constraints are what create the design and um, the second thing I would point to is that um, for for how to address those the constraints the designer may not always be aware of the constraints so figuring out who on the team will be responsible for uh, advising on how to navigate the constraints is really is critical. And then basically providing them with the context of the design and what you are trying to achieve and getting their feedback as early as possible. And um, again, it just points to, um, you know, clear, open, transparent channels of communication that exist since the inception of, of the product ideally. Essentially, you've got the designer who has a vision, has certain 
product goals in mind. You have the manufacturing expertise, and those folks understand the constraints. And it's communication between these two groups or these two folks that allows the designer to achieve the optimal result. Correct. So that's where I think um, these these future platforms, these tools that allow for greater collaboration, greater transparency sharing are, are really helping drive faster time to market and they're helping drive a more integral approach to the end result as well. What I was really impressed with, with RBW talking to Theo more about the business was um, how much of a manufacturing company you are. I, I just didn't know. I mean, you're if you look at your products, and I think people really should because they're really, really cool, is really fascinating to me <laughs> to to because that wouldn't be as obvious. I mean, obviously you have to be made, but you know, you know, one doesn't think as much about that if you just come to the website. I totally agree. As I, I was looking at the RBW website and then layer on the mass customization that you're doing. And I think it, it raises the question of how, how do you do this? And I know you've, you've alluded to this earlier, but tell us how you accomplish these goals. As far as achieving this like uh, fantastic offering, this, this very large offering of customization, we are trying to automate as much as possible, the creation of bills of materials built on the fly. It, it really relies on data structures, which are built with the intent to be integrated, that the architecture is, is set up in such a way that it will match um, with relatively little required in the way of translation, and that there is um, a source of truth within the framework that might be um, one platform for a part of the business. So I think it's it's really like rethinking what do we need in the core platforms of an enterprise and how do we achieve a really efficient and lean um, integration of the platforms. Theo, did you develop this system through a master plan? Did you do it organically? How did it come about? So it's organically come about. It's it's very much still something that we are working on, but um, the master the master plan or the the framework that we have conceived of is it's in a process of validation now, and we're pleased to report that we have connected. Uh, we have achieved a high level of integration connectedness between our shop floor and ERP, and um, we have begun the the connection and have successfully implemented some connection between our CAD platform and our ERP. So we really are, we're really also viewing the connectedness of our platforms as a way to um, also shape our, our essentially work culture so that we can create a feedback loop that as um, you know, we're, we are manufacturing, we're assembling stuff just around the corner from, from where I'm sitting. You have integrated tools, processes, you're talking about feedback loops into your culture. Does all of this place constraints that make design more difficult? Early on in the design process, we're also thinking about the metadata of each model of each object and we're beginning to conceive of like how that will be communicated through our through our inventory, essentially, um, this this ob this this three dimensional model, this object, this digital representation of a part will essentially become the record in ERP, which which is going to dictate inventory and and at least be the kernel for the um, for the ERP metadata. So we're kind of thinking of it as um like models in in different platforms, which when tied together augment the the um, the information. So an example is um, put a fastener in in CAD and what you're typically expecting to see is a part number, probably a description and you know an image with threads. You'd be able to capture the height length width of a model as well. And perhaps in ERP, what you're looking at is probably a part number, a description, who, where you're buying it from, how many you have on hand. and But you may not have an image or a or some of the these surrounding metadata. So what we're really looking at now is um, how those two things can be um, synced and, and merged and how um, that information can be uh, 
bi-directional ideally between your various platforms not not terribly new concept but maybe not something that's very widely implemented and probably certainly not um very often in a cloud-based environment john this breaking down of silos of conceiving at the beginning all of the various parts and the information flows is at the heart of digital transformation. How is this different from, again, as we spoke earlier, historically, the way engineering design manufacturing operated? With digital transformation, I'll also offer the term digital thread is another term people are talking about. In the old world, it was paper-based documents. You know, you had the same processes and problems. You just solve them with paper-based documents and a lot more on-site communication. And so today, I think the things that, that you look for in digital transformation is the digital system is the system of record and it creates a master rich model. And then you have a digital thread is what I think Theo is talking about, where like it's, it, there's one, everything's connected in a sensible way. And the other thing that I know is on Theo's mind is access, that that thread is accessible by all actors um, in, the, in the process, that it's not siloed and saying, well, only the people who know how to use that tool can see it, but it's subject to the business policies of the company, obviously, you make it available to everyone in real time. And so it's a, it's a digital thread that connects all the humans too. You know, if that makes sense, I think those would capture the key ideas from my, to my mind. What about the cultural dimensions of being able to work in an environment that has processes that assume the sharing of information in basically real time? Sure. In some real world examples, I think that information which has the intent to be shared but is not is really only as good as the level of visibility that you can you can provide um, to it so um, f- for us that means for potentially our customer success team might field some um, never happens an issue with a product missed a piece of hardware for example why not provide this team with with the training and then also the visibility into the documents to help correctly identify the issue. But given a framework of with the intent to share, then how do you actually go about sharing it? And what what tools can you use that that enable that real-time access to the latest and greatest version of your of your data? So you've built processes that assume the availability and immediate sharing of information. That sounds like it sounds like it's core to your operations. Absolutely. That's a huge part of what we're trying to do is empower our individuals to be um, leaders on our team. Um, and so the, the information access is a fundamental component of that. As we finish up, let me ask you both to share advice. First, Theo, give us advice for designers who are listening to this who say, yeah, this sounds great. I want to do that too. What should they do? I found an entrepreneurial avenue for us to continue to explore design, but alongside that, we kind of had to question the boundary of what what design was for us. And we, we um, look beyond not only design, but also begin to sort of bleed that practice over into very operational considerations. And so my advice to designers, I think, in, in this era of digital transformation is also to question sort of where does design practice end and where does design practice need to begin um, to to integrate with with other um, operational aspects of, of a business. What advice do you have for manufacturers on working successfully with designers like you? To budget time to explore new methods of working because I think that our industry won't advance without uh, people operating from from the same page, so um, allowing your organization to to find time to to experiment to explore new ways of working is going to help us all achieve industry 4.0. And John, you're going to get the last word. What advice do you have for manufacturers 
who want to do well in this world of communication and tight coupling between design and manufacturing? Well, right back to the agility. If you're a manufacturer, if you're not tightly coupled with design, whether you're doing the design or it's your customers doing the design, um, if you're not tightly coupled and you're not agile, you're not going to be in, in the pole position going forward. You know, the power of that joint agility of design and manufacturing connection is, is a force that all manufacturers have to either join, you either have to join that kind of thinking, or you'll get beaten by that kind of thinking in the future. Okay. Lots of words of innovation and inspiration and great advice. Theo Richardson and John Herstick, thank you so much for taking time to speak with us today. Thank you, Michael. Michael, John, thank you so much. <laughs>